Right, I've taken this title from the website, the PGP website, which I think is quite a striking title. We love the people behind the data. And I want to focus on openness, accountability and commercialization in PGP UK. So, the communitarian ideal which I think Stephen has identified, and I think also in a way Helen is talking about, uh, was originally seen as the ideal behind human genome projects and the human genome was seen as the common property of humanity and this came out in several international declarations. Now many people including myself uh, do advocate open access to the inherently public property of the genome but I think what we mean, what I mean by open access may be slightly different from what I understand Stephen to mean because my version of it also includes extensive governance rights for contributors to databases and biobanks. Now, you may think that that is pie in the sky, but in fact, it is eminently practical. Work on something called the Charitable Trust Model has been going on for the last 15 years, particularly in the US, and David Winnikoff and Larissa Neumann have developed very detailed and practical governance mechanisms which actually allow research participants and biobank donors to take part in decisions about what kind of research will be undertaken, what sorts of sponsors will be allowed, um, what the patenting policy will be, all sorts of other commercial decisions. And four years ago, this model was actually adopted by a state biotrust for health, which is an infant heel prick blood spot PKU type of biobank. And working with David Winnikoff in particular, the Michigan government actually collaborated with community advisory boards and set up this mechanism, which is based on the same model that you would have if, for example, you had a financial trust set up in your, for your benefit. It would give you certain rights, and the equivalent is the donors having the same rights as the person for whom the trust is set up. So the key point here, I think, is that they have really robust governance mechanisms. And well, very many biobanks, including UK Biobank, have a sort of assurance of stewardship or custodian, custodianship. These mechanisms actually go further. And to my mind, and I think this is the key point that I would like to draw out, these institutions of governance are actually even more important than individual consent. Now, I'm not saying that individual consent is something to be laughed at. I'm certainly not saying that. And I do think that blanket consent is too broad of the sort that we are seeing in PGP. Okay. But I think it's really also very important that we widen out the debate to look at these practical institutions of governance. So we have that at one end of the spectrum of biobanks, and I am sort of including this as under the rubric of biobanks, although I know strictly speaking it is not a biobank. But I think many of the mechanisms are somewhat similar. We also have a situation in which a very commercialized model at the other end of the spectrum is coming to predominate, even in public banks. And the example that springs to my mind is commodified international trade among umbilical cord blood banks. That is, for example, in the UK, where we have, I think, six public cord blood banks. They engage in a commodified international trade in units. The units were do donated altruistically. But by engaging in this trade, which is actually quite lucrative, up to £30,000 per unit, the banks can actually help to subsidize their operations. So that's one form of commercialized biobank, although it looks to be public. Among genomic data banks, 23andMe, which was mentioned this morning, the retail genetics firm 23andMe, is at this commercialized end of the spectrum. Uh, and before the Food and Drug Administration halted its activities in November of last year, the firm was nearing a target which was equivalent to UK Biobank <coughs> of 500,000 donors, or at least they, asked, they hoped to get to that target in 2014, of genetic samples and epidemiological data. Now, where does PGP UK fit on this spectrum? I don't think it's immediately obvious that it's at one end or the other. I think it's somewhere in the middle. And if we make this spectrum include not simply openness of consent, but also accountability, public accountability, and commercialization, then I think it becomes rather more interesting. So, although it isn't formally a biobank, and it's not commercially owned, so it's not like 23andMe, 
with its links to Google. There are still, I think, quite interesting parallels in the language, and that's why I chose the title, We Love the People Behind the Data, because 23andMe has a similarly participative and inclusive, as it sees it, relationship emphasis. It <coughs> emphasizes ongoing relationship with the people it calls its, quote, active genomes. And these people provide the data with bio-value, which is rather similar to what goes on in PGP UK, because of the ongoing relationship with feeding back of phenotypic information and health information that participants in PGP UK, as I understand it, are also asked to do. Similarly, 23andMe, again a commercial firm, lays a very strong emphasis on working together for scientific research. So I don't think that simply saying that your research aims are altruistic necessarily distinguishes the commercial from the more public firms uh, or bodies. And 23andMe uh, says, we believe research is a two-way process where participants are valued as partners. Now, in fact, the participants have no property entitlements in 23andMe and no access to any sort of governance mechanisms on the same model as the Winnikoff Charitable Trust model. They are customers. They're paying on average about $100, sometimes more, paying to be altruistic by providing further details. That is, they are asked to fill out surveys that have headings like, tell me some more things about yourself. <laughs> so giving more of your own personal health data, feeding back your personal epidemiological data. Nevertheless, they are customers. PGP participants are not customers. But I think that's extremely clear. And they are indeed receiving a benefit in the genetic sequence, which would otherwise cost a minimum, as I understand it, at today's rates of about $1,000. The quid pro quo is that they must agree to surrender their anonymity. And as we've said, that is actually an admirably honest statement that PGP UK makes them. They are being frank about it. Um, 23andMe is rather less open about the policy, but in fact, the policy is rather similar. It is quite open in fact. I've mentioned the ongoing participation. 23andMe does encourage people, it calls its active genomes, to stay that way. But it doesn't actually require safety reports, which I understand PGP US does, or the agreement to be recontacted for optional specimen taking, which I believe is part of the model for PGP. And PGP does state, excuse the typo there, it does uh, require safety reports of between half and quarterly, I believe, half yearly and quarterly, uh, and agreement to be recontacted. Please correct me if I'm wrong you know, later on any of these points, Stephen. I'm happy to be corrected. Um, it does state also that participation in the PGP is an ongoing relationship, best seen as a benefit to humanity as a whole, <coughs> excuse me, rather than to the participants themselves. So, PGP is explicitly non-individualist. It's talking about benefits to society rather than to the individuals taking part. It's explicitly communitarian. And I began this talk by saying that the original vision of the human genome was communitarian. But in some other ways, it seems to me it's rather more in the classic top-down scientist-to-public mode than either 23andMe or the charitable trust model. And to my mind, the entrance exam is is actually quite a good example of that. That is, you have to take the exam, you have to pass the exam, okay, that has the benefit of making it quite clear that you have given informed consent. And legally, that uh, I know you use that term advisedly, you have given consent, uh, which would be informed by a certain level of knowledge as evidenced in the exam. But it does seem to me that PGP is much less specific about entitlements of participants and rights of participants than about their duties. So the duty, for example, to take the exam or to be recontacted. By contrast, in the charitable trust model, full disclosure of all pending commercial interests must be made to the participant. A donor approval committee, which is on the shareholder model, like shareholder representation, is elected periodically through proxy voting. And I think quite importantly, in the charitable trust model, if the biobank or the database fails, and that is a very real risk in modern biotechnology, a certain amount of easy come, easy go, um, with firms with, and other bodies appearing and, and disappearing. Char the charitable trust then can prevent takeover by the highest bidder. UK Biobank, if I just bring that in briefly as a comparison, is constituted legally as a corporation. So the contributors don't own the original tissue and they don't own any further epidemiological data.
but rather like the charitable trust model, they do have some protections that at the moment I don't see in PGP, though I would like to suggest that perhaps they might like to consider them. And one of them is that UK Biobank can't simply sell the samples to the highest bidder or the biobank uh, in, in its entirety. And donors also have the right to withdraw the samples from UK Biobank. By contrast, the PGP UK consent form says, as well as providing us with a specimen, you are consenting to an open-ended set of things which may be derived from it. Now that is what is usually called a blanket consent. That is a very open consent, which doesn't specify whether you might not want particular uses to be made. For example, some biobanks allow participants to say that they don't want their tissue or umbilical tissue to be used for uh, cosmetics and other such purposes. They also don't seem to say any, uh, to give any particular control over downstream uses such as the derivation of cell lines, which was a big issue recently in the Henrietta Lacks case. I'm not likening PGP UK to the Henrietta Lacks case, let me just make that clear. But that cell lines are a very controversial area. Henrietta Lacks was the black American woman in the 50s who had a very extensive uh, cell line developed from her cells from an ovarian cancer which killed her, but which is useful in scientific <coughs> research because the cells divide so quickly. So the language of sharing, which is very strong in PGP UK and which I'm very sympathetic to, doesn't itself clarify the question of commercial partners and patents. To go back to 23andMe, last year, no, in 2012, it took out a commercial patent for a gene related to Parkinson's disease. Uh, and participants were very angry about this because they felt that they had acted altruistically, but that the firm had acted commercially. And there was one guy, I'd just, I just like to read his, his quote, if I may. Um, yes, he said, this was one of their contributors who said, I had assumed that 23andMe was against patenting genes and felt in total cahoots all along with you guys. If I'd known that you were going, going to go down that route with my data, I'm not sure I would have answered any surveys. So if people feel that their altruism is being betrayed or undermined in some way, taken advantage of, it's perhaps a less emotive term, then you have to be careful. You might wind up with a rather distrustful research population. Uh, and we know from the US Greenberg case in which parents of children with Canavan disease contributed voluntarily both the children's tissue, their own time, and money to a biobank which was then taken over for commercial purposes without their consent. We know that that can be a very controversial area. So to conclude, these what have been called contested commodities of patents, cell lines, and databases do represent the main asset for many biotechnology firms, what has sometimes been called promissory capital. And the questions for the future, which I would like to debate here and to propose perhaps for PGP's consideration, is, are these. First, is individual consent sufficient protect participants, or do they need more explicit governance mechanisms along the model of a charitable trust, or indeed some other model? What would PGP UK's policy be on patents and commercialization? And would it consider including representation of participants on the bottom-up model of the charitable trust? And I would just like to say thank you to my colleague at Helix at Oxford, Jane Kay, uh, who is the ethics and social implications leader for PGP UK for the comments in an earlier draft of this paper. Thank you very much.